Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from around the world. Uh, we are excited to have you with us here for this live panel discussion on RTC in the metaverse. Hope you've been enjoying RTC at scale as much as I've been. Uh, my name is Sriram Srinivasan. I work on next generation audio technologies here at Meta across the family of apps. Before joining Meta, I was a group engineering manager at Microsoft, leading the audio R&D uh, teams for Microsoft Teams, Skype, and Azure communication services. It is my ple pleasure and privilege today to host our distinguished panelists, each a pioneer and leader in their areas. Cullen Jennings is CTO of security and collaboration products at Cisco. He's the inventor of WebEx hologram, which provides real-time photorealistic 3D holograms of people and objects for conferencing and collaboration. If you're working on WebRTC, odds are you're leveraging Cullen's work one way or the other. He is a co-author of the WebRTC uh, specification and a contributor to standards and open source code used for many real-time communication systems. Colin holds a PhD from the University of British Columbia uh, in computer vision, and he's an avid kiteboarder. Welcome, Colin. Great to have you with us. Thank you. <laughs> for those of you who missed Paul's excellent talk in the first session, this is your second chance. Uh, Paul Baustert is Vice President of Product for Dolby's developer platform, Dolby.io. Uh, he's passionate about the intersection between online entertainment and communications. Paul's startup Spatial Voice was acquired by Dolby. He continues to build spatial communication products and services for games, virtual environments, and conferencing within Dolby. Paul, super excited to have you here. Looking forward to hearing your perspectives on RTC in the metaverse. Our uh, third panelist, Mike. Mike Arcuri is Meta's product lead for the cloud platform supporting Horizon and Facebook Gaming. This platform hosts scores of popular mobile and PC games, enables millions of people to play them instantly on any device. Mike has also incubated the key, uh, key parts of the Spark AR platform. Prior to his work at Meta, Mike led product management, marketing, and engineering efforts at several startups, as well as product teams on flagship Microsoft products like Excel, Outlook, and SharePoint. Thanks for joining us today, Mike. Hi, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. Uh, so just a quick reminder, we'll have Q&A at the end of this live session. Uh, so please share your questions as comments in the Facebook live video stream feed like you've been doing for the other sessions. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Looking forward to hearing what's top of your minds on this uh, topic. So the question, um, metaverse may mean different things to many people, to different people. Colin, I'd like to start with you. What does metaverse mean to you? Well, you know, one of the things exciting about it is there's so many different communities and groups that have different ideas of what it is and things to bring to it. But, uh, you know, really to me, I think about what's possible and what it is. And what I want to see happen is I see a 3D shared space that links lots of things together, that brings people together in a way that we can, you know, work, play, learn. All of those topics are something that we can do in this space. And to achieve that, we really need to be able to bring in multiple different applications into the same space. Uh, multiple different content from different creators, different providers, all and lots of people into the same space into it. And when I think about it too, I'm, I'm not only focused on the purely virtual space that we mostly think about, but I find many of the most interesting use cases bring it into the real world too. So when I can bring this into a physical space as well. So I think the augmented reality parts of it also fit into the whole thing. So I'm pretty excited to see how we bring all of those different things together and the, the sort of grow the ecosystem to, to build all of that and have it work together in a linked way that's positive like the internet. Yeah, there's so much here. 3D space that brings users, apps and content together across physical and virtual worlds. Um, Paul, what's your definition? Uh, so I see the metaverse as a mesh of interconnected virtual worlds, much like the World Wide Web is um, the interconnection of websites. So these virtual worlds will enable people to go online to play games, work, share expo social experiences like online events, concerts. Obviously, there's virtual worlds like this at the moment, but they're really separate islands with very little in common with how you interact with the world. You also have different identities, friendship relationships. So to me, the metaverse is about the industry working together to create a much more seamless experience for users, moving between worlds created by different people and entities, enabling you to keep your virtual identity, maybe even digital possessions as you move around. And with virtual worlds becoming more consumer friendly and consistent, we believe that more and more of our entertainment experiences will be in these virtual worlds instead of a fixed 2D view. And 
they'll be much more interactive and shared with others. I think the shared experience part of the metaverse is a real driving factor for it at the moment. It's really exciting to see how movies, online events, and all these other experiences are going to evolve as we go forward. Mike, uh, do you want to add something here? Yeah, sure. I mean, there have been some really great writings online, like article series, all about what the metaverse uh, can be and the concepts that make it up. But I think the phrase that means the most to me um, is the embodied internet, right? So uh, what do we mean by embodied? Well, much like uh, Colin and, and Paul are saying, you, you would move through an internet space, right? Much like uh, playing an online video game today. Um, you have some kind of physical representation, well, virtual physical representation, like an avatar, right? And so being embodied uh, with other people in a shared uh, space that, that kind of mimics uh, reality a little bit, that's, uh, that's the embodied part. But the, the word internet is also quite important because, you know, what I take away from internet is um, it's open to some degree, that many companies are contributing, that many creators are building, um, and that uh, you can travel between these experiences or these spaces uh, pretty seamlessly, right? And so I think, uh, you know, that, that's just kind of the, the great North Star phrase for me, the embodied internet. Um, how do we change what we experience uh, day in and day out for work uh, and for fun um, to be embodied? Um, and still open and have the good things of the internet today. Themes are emerging here. So listening to the three of you, it's a shared 3D space, embodied internet, uh, realistic representations, uh, love the intersection with gaming, the importance of the internet. This is fascinating. So, so with that mental model of you know, the definitions of the metaverse that we've heard now, I'd like to move on to something closer to the theme of this conference, uh, communication is core to the metaverse, like we've heard throughout uh, the day so far. Uh, what's your vision for RTC in the metaverse, Colin? You know, so everything's better with friends and colleagues, right? I mean, the whole internet is about collaboration very much of it. Now, I, I realize that probably everybody watching this, that uh, you came to this conference somewhat biased, and we think it, you know, collaboration is more part of it. But there will be lots of different forms of collaboration that, that, that form different ways in this environment. The ones that I'm most excited about are the ones that are really authentic forms where we can really see some. So I am excited about the idea of what can photorealistic holograms bring? Uh, what can haptics type touch bring to this? What do those enable for a really uh, you know, immersive experience? Like, and I'm sure that there's a wide range of where it's right to have avatars or other virtual characters or, or fantasy things that could never really happen in the real world, but it's the authentic experiences where I really know what someone's thinking and, and how they feel about something and the really subtle parts of it that I, I find really interesting. So a lot of our work on WebEx Hologram has been about bringing in uh, a photorealistic version of me. And we've, we've looked at various versions of things We've gone with a light field based approach. And I think that's one of the things that'll be interesting to see all the different approaches. Like we heard about point clouds earlier today, which is a technique we've looked at a bunch, really interesting. We've seen texture map polygons. Uh, if I hold up something like a glass of water, you know, this is, this is a difficult task to represent. And it's a very common thing that happens to really be able to get the colors through the water, to get the, the shape of the water, the surface of the water floating right there and stuff. And getting that level of realism in complete 3D hologram when you're viewing it through some, some AR, VR goggles or something is why I went down the light field approach. But it's that type of experiences that I think will make it fully immersive and that is the fully immersive part of it that will make it a substantially better experience than the sort of traditional communications we've had. So I thought sort of Justin nailed it earlier when he said it's, it's an exciting time to be a real-time communication developer. I think there's a whole new range of stuff now. I've seen a demo of WebEx hologram. That's some exciting stuff you're building there. Uh, Mike, this is, this is your day job working on Horizon at Meta. Uh, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, it, it's just so interesting to think about communication and the forms of communication, you know, given this new metaverse palette, let's call it. Uh, I mean, it, uh, from one point of view, it becomes a replacement for some technologies we're using today in, in some cases. So in, instead of this Zoom call with, with all of you watching on a flat live stream in a window on, on your computer, what if we had a virtual shared space where we were embodied and 
the panelists were talking on a virtual stage and, and you were there listening to us in the audience and you could walk up to a virtual microphone and, and you could be allowed to ask questions and we could answer your questions and it would feel different, right? But we'd be accomplishing the same type of scenario that we're accomplishing today with video and audio conferencing. Um, but that's not the only thing like metaverse as a replacement. You can also be in one of those environments and need to communicate with someone. Right. Let's imagine I'm having an entertaining experience in a haunted house world that was built by a Horizon Worlds creator. Um, and I'd like one of my sons, uh, you know, to come join me. Well, how would I get in touch with him? I'm in the metaverse right now. I'm in the haunted house world right now. Can I bring up a virtual cell phone and start a virtual video call on my virtual cell phone that goes to my son's real cell phone? where he's probably in his bedroom playing video games, right? And then he could answer that call on his cell phone and then tap some button and then come join me in that kind of embodied experience. And, and so, you know, this can, can turn into inception if you, you think about it hard enough, but there are needs to both communicate in the embodied environment and then communicate kind of from the embodied environment, but out to other people who may be doing other things. Point. Um... You mentioned about having this whole panel discussion, for instance, in uh, in the virtual space, right? Um, so I think Saba spoke about this a little bit in the keynote as well. A lot of the audio that we may find tolerable in this kind of a 2D setup, they, they get magnified in that scenario which you were just describing, uh, Mike. Because if I turn to my left, you're sitting right there and you ask me a question, you expect an answer soon, like in real life. Otherwise, I sound stupid taking 400 milliseconds to answer that question. Right? And it's the same thing. Uh, we are in the shared space, but in reality, we're all just joining from our living rooms, our offices, each with our own noises, background noise, reverb, et cetera. So not compensating for all of that is going to break the immersion. So it's going to need a giant leap in the audio space. Uh, Paul, I'm curious, what do you think about this? What are your thoughts on this? Oh, thanks, Ram. Yeah, I think you really have to somewhat rethink voice communications in virtual worlds. In traditional conferencing, which we're all used to, you have a single group of people taking turns talking. However, in a virtual world, you, you can recreate a much more natural environment by rendering voices spatially from the location of the avatars that are talking, distance attenuated, so when people are off at a distance, they're quieter. It really enables you to self-organize and have separate overlapping conversations all in the same space. So it's very different to the conferencing which we have at the moment. And so our brains are really good at dealing with these spatially separated voices, and we can focus on the voice we want to. However, if too much noise breaks through from the real world, it, become, it can become really distracting, and it can make it really hard to understand people around you and will kill the sense of immersion. It could get very irritating. So noise suppression is much more important if you've got social, um, complex social environments with many people around you. It's also important to get the levels correct, otherwise distance attenuation is, is ineffective. And, and our experience is you have to look at really each segment of the audio chain and adjust it for the best experience. Delay is also super important. If, if the delay is high, the conversation is stilted, you will talk over the top of each other. But also you've got to think about the delay if you say if you're at a concert, the delay from the artist presenting a, a very high quality concert to the audience and the audience responding to try and, delay is important to try and get that interaction back in online events. Um, so to get this right, um, you, can, uh, you can replicate complex social um, environments online and you can get a sense of the crowd around you while maintaining, maintaining intelligibility of the voices that you're listening to. And one thing that's important here is we want to engineer the audio for intelligibility, not realism. You don't want to sound like you're in this cavernous space with lots of glass. You actually want it to be intelligible, but look cool like a cavernous space with lots of glass. Um, so I really like this idea of replicating these social gatherings on online spaces. Imagine a networking event after this conference where the conference attendees co congregate in a virtual space and talk with colleagues and meet new people. Um, I really also like the idea of being able to replicate an audience at an online concert where you can talk with your friends, listen to a band and hear the energy of the crowd around you. We're really missing these sorts of social experience and this interactivity on in online events at the moment. And one little bit to that of what I think is really important with the audio quality is, I mean, we've had a lot of conversation in the back in the side channel here about latency and the, the Q and A's for it. And 
I mean, latency is such a key part of this. And we're seeing huge improvements in that over time right now. I, I mean, uh, you know, Dave Detat is constantly reminding me about buffer bloat and the stuff we need to do there to reduce latency. Um, we have satellite networks coming up that are presenting lower latency. I think we're moving to a time where the primary metric of how good your internet connectivity will be will not be how much bandwidth you have. It'll be how low the latency is and bringing that down. And, yeah. and I've been waiting, like when I look for signposts that will, the world will change when we hit this point. And my view is like esports will totally change when Tokyo to New York latency hits 70 milliseconds. And that is like now foreseeable and it wasn't before. Um, you know, so those types of things, I, I think this latency is a huge part of what's going to empower and make metaverse of happen, you know, be possible now and that it wasn't before. No, yeah, sure. Latency is, is the topic for today. I'm seeing a lot of questions in the live uh, uh, comments as well. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, so clearly communication is going to be core to realism and immersion. We have to get it right. But again, lots of challenges, but also lots of opportunities uh, for this community here. Uh, that leads me, leads me to my next question. Um, just like RTC today is a mix of mobile, desktop, and meeting rooms. Uh, for the foreseeable future, it's fair to expect that people will enter the metaverse with a mix of devices, you know, laptops and phones on the one hand, interacting with AR and VR devices. Um, Colin, since you're at it, how, how do you see this mix playing out? Oh, this is this. We're in an amazing time on that. So I get to try every single new headset that comes out and everything. And let, let's be really clear: the the price point and quality and performance of the Quest headset has just changed what's possible. I think that's another thing that I talk about. It's changing and making this possible now, right? Is there's so much you can experience on that. So I think how this will play out is initially uh, VR will be the primary experience, and we'll see that. Um, over time, I think the the AR, my experience with the AR headsets, particularly Magic Leap Two and some of the other ones, um, is that that's a really compelling experience bringing things together. So I think that over time we'll see the augmented reality headsets uh, t play a bigger role, but not to start with. And of course, this stuff doesn't work unless it's inclusive with everyone. So inclusive everyone means bringing the mobiles in and, and even probably 2G mobiles. I didn't realize that until I saw the talk earlier today. Uh, but you know, bringing that all, all together. So this is going to be a really challenging part of designing these experiences is how do you make an experience that's um, amazing when you have something like a high-end he headset yet still works and you can still participate when you don't. And, and that's, uh, I, again, one of the exciting things about this space, how to make that all work together. Yeah, yeah 2G, I didn't think of that. I was thinking more VR, AR, but you're right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we have to think of that too. Uh, Mike, how do you look at this at uh, Meta? How do you look at this hybrid device ecosystem? Yeah, well, I mean, I think Colin made some great points. VR devices are selling really well. That wasn't always the case, but now they're selling really well. And I, I think that's terrific. That's amazing because they do provide the best experience and VR, AR will continue to provide the most immersive, you know, real feeling experience for the foreseeable future. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of things we do here at Meta um, reach billions of people. Right. And uh, we need, need to be <laughs> very conscious of those orders of magnitude in terms of scale, like two years, three years from now, th there probably will be tens of millions of people in VR at any given moment. But there'll be billions of people interacting with each other through real time communication techniques. Right. And so um, we just need to be cognizant uh, of that, like to, to really make the metaverse uh, live up to its potential to make it accessible to the world's people and audiences, um, it has to be available on the device that you have handy. Um, because anytime you reach out to someone else and ask them to join you, anytime you want to participate in something and you're on the go, um, you know, you, you may not have that VR device charged up, ready, you know, be in a, a 10 by 10 foot open space where you can deploy it successfully. I mean, you know, um, yeah, there are all kinds of constraints. So, yeah, in your earlier comments, you just gave that powerful example, right? I mean, you call your son, he has to enter the metaverse with whatever device he has at hand. Um, you're not going to call him and he say, Dad, wait a sec, let me go grab my uh, headset. Um, yeah, and in my house, that would be, oh, but my younger brother used it last night and he forgot <laughs> to plug it back in and now the battery is dead. Like this happens, you know, all the right, time. Right. Yeah. yeah. My next question is top of mind for many. I'm also seeing some questions on this. Um, how can we prevent several 
parallel metaverses and what's your vision for people in different metaverses to communicate with one another? Uh, Mike, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this to get us started. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's one way to look at this, which is like, it's really hard. Like, how do we make sure that we design something that's open with all these companies moving as fast as they can? Um, but I think what we can take solace in is the fact that we are starting from the internet and the internet is already open and it's based on open protocols. And I don't think we're going to be building a new thing that doesn't use HTTP and you know RTC and SSL. Like we're gonna continue to use the things that worked for the mobile internet um, as we expand into this embodied internet. Um, and so by evolving what's already there, we do have a very good basis for, for openness. Um, and some of the companies that, that are most involved in building this out, um, you know, I won't, I won't name names, but uh, maybe, you know, mention uh, Meta, for example, like we are thinking of third parties and even what we do, how can we make it available for people as creators and then how can we make it available for companies that do things in entertainment, that do things in work um, and, and make our services available um, so that people can have, uh, I guess what I would call a continuous experience, right? Uh, in some future world where you interact with a Disney property and then you interact with um, a Zoom call and then you interact with a meta property, can you use the same avatar in all those scenarios? Can you bring the same inventory of handy stuff with you uh, through those experiences? Um, those are the kinds of things we're gonna need to design next on top of the, the protocols is these services or, or shared services that allow for that feeling of continuity. That, uh, con continuity is a fascinating concept. I mean, it's, it's so natural for us in the physical world and you only expect that also um, in the virtual world for realism. That's an important area, lots to do here. Colin, uh, Cisco WebEx interrupts with you know, Microsoft Teams, with Google Meet, with Zoom. So that's worked reasonably well in the traditional VC space. How do you see interrupt developing in the metaverse? Uh, well, it's gonna be hard, that's for sure. But I, I think that uh, we have the expression bridges, not islands. And the thing that I think that we need is, you know, is, is a, create a baseline of, of standards and of uh, open source that allows us to bring these things together. And the important thing to understand that I think will drive this is if I have, uh, if somebody's building a space that I want to participate in, but I can bring other applications and content into that, that adds value to that space. I mean, in games, we'd call it users or content. Uh, you know, the thing is, it's not a zero sum game. The more we get this to work right, it makes everybody's piece more valuable to bring the other pieces into it and bring it together. So I think there's a huge incentive to figure this out. And I think the, the platforms and groups of companies that, that do manage to figure that out uh, and work together on it will, will be the, the ones that emerge and will be the, the system that people want to use. Now, that said, this is, I think this looks much harder than anything we were attempting with WebRTC when we started that. But on the other hand, I think that the uh, amount of energy and number of people and resources and, and, and just mental insight being put into it is you know, more than 10x what we had when we started WebRTC. So I'm, I'm very optimi optimistic of how this will all come together. I think that, that also answers this question, but I'll just uh, list it out here. We have a question from Mejaros Mihali um, from the audience. What are your thoughts to follow the same open development path that WebRTC 1.0 follow? It would be great if you plan Metaverse in a similar way to an open standard and work on it in IETF, W3C, or other big standardization bodies. What are your plans in the collaboration between companies and standardization of the Metaverse? Uh, I think you answered a lot of this. If there's anything else you want to add to this, uh, go ahead, Colin. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you know, some people on this call that were, or many people watching who were deeply involved in are like, oh no, don't make all the mistakes over again. I mean, there was a lot to be learned from how we did WebRTC right and wrong. But yeah, I mean, the end outcome that we came to, I think is, it was, it was very important. We got a bunch of the right people together. We figured out how to drive this thing forward. I think ITF, W3C, a lot of the things that we've built on in the past are going to be important parts of, of getting this done. Uh, not the only parts. But I think in the end, the most important thing is bringing together a community of like-minded people that are setting a common vision of what they're trying to accomplish. And maybe this conference today is a, is a beginning of exactly that. I'm very hopeful for that. Great, great thoughts. 
Paul, any quick thoughts to wrap this up? Uh, I think we can um, we can learn a lot from what made the internet successful as well. It was really the World Wide Web that made the internet explode. And it was really a simple concept of a URL that provided links between sites with a simple markup language to render pages. It didn't matter who was running the website. To the user, it was one internet. With the metaverse, um, as we're talking here, I think we need similar standards or similar ways of doing things. The World Wide Web is easy to use. You navigate pages in the same way, scroll and click. Navigating in the metaverse should be equally as intuitive with standard methods of moving and interacting with the environment. And if you go from one environment owned by one body to another, it shouldn't be completely different. Um, that won't be a great experience. And I think we need to um, look at the way we communicate across the world as well, because communication is core to the experience. So if we have different ways of muting across different worlds, then I'm sure people will embarrass themselves quite a lot. Um, and I agree with Mike is we need to be able to take your personalized avatar around um, between different worlds, but I also think you may want a voice to suit that avatar and that voice should go around with you as well. So I think doing, making this consistent will also help the metaverse. That's fantastic. Yeah, we've discussed what the metaverse means to us, a vision for RTC in the metaverse, continuity in the metaverse, which uh, a few of you have alluded to how different devices interact with each other within the metaverse and how different metaverses may possibly interact with each other. Uh, so let's bring me to my next question. We have all the right people here in this conference. What are the biggest challenges to making our metaverse a success? Paul? So to me, one of the biggest challenges to making real-time communication success in the metaverse is replicating what we do in the real world and creating compelling experiences that scale to large events and online gatherings. If, if the experiences which we go to are isolating, um, where you hear the event, but the audience are just silent avatars with preset emotes or movements, it's probably gonna be more compelling to watch a really nicely produced live stream. However, if you watch an event, a virtual concert, um, like a virtual concert in a virtual environment with your friends talking around you and you feel the energy of the crowd. I think people will prefer to attend an online event in the metaverse instead of the live stream. And I think we can probably make it as compelling or, or at least a lot more convenient than attending concerts and other events um, in person. Also, if we enable the band, the comedians, the presenters to hear and see the energy of the crowd, crowd and react in real time, this will make events more compelling and there'll be more energy coming from the presenters themselves. It's really hard to present dry. So if we can bring this interactivity back, it's gonna be amazing. And obviously low delay, both for the communications, plus also broadcasting a high quality experience is hugely important. But I think it's a worthy challenge to take on. And it's not just audio. You also need fluid movements, gestures, facial expressions of the presenters as well as the audience. And I think this is really important to add additional context to the communication. Sure, yeah. I know, I know people have um, spoken about the experience of recording talks in a dry fashion without any feedback. <laughs> uh, certainly having that interactivity is gonna be super important. Uh, Mike, anything to add before we move on? Yeah, I mean, we have talked a lot about things like driving to low latency to enable these collaborative scenarios. But one thing we haven't mentioned yet is um, kind of streaming the whole experience, right? So, I mean, a lot of what my teams do is uh, work to provide instant access to uh, what are normally fat client experiences, you know, video games or Horizon, right? But without any download, without any waiting. Um, and so if we think of that technology stack, um, you know, what would it take to be in a metaverse experience that's streamed to you and then initiate calls right? You might have the same identity and now we have to handle streams within streams, right? So um, I do think just in terms of our architectures, um, in terms of the standards and the, the player experience or user experience that's required, um, we're going to have to get creative um, and, and do not, not just like tune what's there, but invent some new, new solutions from, from whole cloth. Uh, streaming, yeah. That reminds me, I, I love the streaming functionality on the Quest 2, you know, uh, I have to explain to my seven-year-old, you have to grow up a little bit before you can put it on, but she's happy enough looking at, when I'm, I'm doing something on it, we stream it onto a laptop and she's happy enough for now. I don't know how long that'll last though. Um, 
let's move on. Um, I think we have a lot of questions from the audience. So before we move on to the audience Q&A, it would be a mess if I don't ask this question first. Uh, in the pandemic era, post-pandemic era, however you want to call this, uh, how do you envision hybrid work, which many refer to as the future of work, um, to shape RTC in general and specifically even RTC in the metaverse? Uh, Colin, your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I mean, we all know all the problems with it. We've experienced them more than ever in the last two years. But the heart of those problems is the asymmetric experience. Uh, it's a very different experience for the remote people from the people who are local and, and in the scene. And we have saw talk after talk this morning about like spatial audio, how it works for that, holograms, how they work with it, how the, the sense of presence and having people real. And so I believe that the type of experiences that we're talking about here for the metaverse of bringing everybody into um, a shared environment with things like spatial audio, full holograms, haptics, uh, will really reduce the asymmetry, asymmetry and we get you know the sort of 10x better experience than what we've had in the past. Uh, and I, I just think that that's absolutely necessary to get a, a really great hybrid experience is to try and reduce that asymmetry and have a, a good uh, and just less difference between the two. So that's what I'm looking for. And, and I, I, I think it's a long path to get there, but I, I fully believe that that's what the next 10 years has to bring for us. Fantastic. I think this has been a really awesome discussion. I, I want to move on to some more questions from the audience. Um, let's take this from uh, Robert Eichner, my uh, colleague from my past work at Microsoft. Um, Robert asks, what do you think are the requirements we need to meet to avoid motion sickness and nausea when using VR headsets for real-time communications? Cisco claims, so I guess this question goes to you, Colin. Cisco claims that their hologram tech doesn't have those issues, so wondering why. <laughs> so uh, probably a more accurate claim would be doesn't have now. The number one metric that I wish I had tracked when we started this project was time to feeling like you were going to throw up. And when we first started, uh, I could I was writing a lot of the code and I could put it on and run it for about 15 seconds before I had a splitting head up and through felt like I wanted to Ralph. Um, but the problem is the reason that happens is you aren't getting all the cues right and there's something wrong. We'd have a bug that had the distortion wrong or the motion slightly wrong. And as we removed bug after bug after bug and figured out what was going on, it was very subtle things and suddenly that sort of disappeared. And now when we, we, we you know, you have to come see a demo to try it out to believe me is the only way to do it. But hundreds of people have tried it now and we never have that comment about motion sickness on any of the headsets now. So partially headsets improved. The frame rates you need to not have motion sickness are well beyond what I believe they were when they started the project. You know, a lot of our things about how humans comprehend and what frame rates you need, they don't take into the fact that we have many different parts of our brain that are all processing the data at different rates and different speeds. So some parts of our brain need a very high frame rate, even though movies might only work at 25 frames per second in a dark room. That is not enough for other things. And if you don't have a very high frame rate in some of the parts that matter, then you have these motion, then your brain knows there's something wrong and you start to have these motion sickness issues. So I think that that has really been the, the, the secret to me is that if you're, if you're having that, it's a sign that something isn't right in your, your brain finds something wrong with the experience and you need to go figure out what that is and remove it from the, the fix it. So, uh, and I think that we will get better at this. We'll learn more about it with everything that's being developed in the metaverse over time. Um, but it's, it's a big issue. I wish we tracked it as a metric time to throw up. Great, yeah. Um, maybe you should come up with that metric. It's, it's kind of <laughs> <laughs> so here, next question from Ashok, um, a colleague of mine at Meta. Uh, soon we will bump against hard limits to latency due to the speed of light. For example, it's probably impossible to send a network packet from India to the US in under 50 milliseconds. Will this limit how real time and immersive the experience can be? Do you see potential approaches to mitigate this? I mean, I can say a few words about this. I mean, our, our teams are, are looking at latency all the time, measuring it and, and doing it in a, you know, a, a probabilistic way, right? So what's the P75, what's the P90, you know, for large networks. Um, and, and I think there are a couple techniques that are interesting. So one is uh, prediction, right? So like in VR devices, they often make predictions about where will the position and the rotation of the eyeballs be 
in 40 milliseconds or, or something like that, right? And so if you can get that prediction to have pretty small error rates, then even with a little bit of lag, you can render the right things at the, the right times. So, so that one's interesting. Um, you know, I think there are different ways of doing uh, network topologies to get us close to that kind of theoretical limit that, that you were describing, right? Like to, to be really close to the edge, to, to have racks, you know, in your wireless carriers, uh, you know, data centers, these kinds of things. Um, and, and companies will need to pursue that um, to, to drive latency out. Um, you know, the last thing I'll, I'll say is you can try to design experiences that are a little tolerant of a little bit of latency, right? Um, and so, you know, this doesn't translate a hundred percent, but it's an example. Like when we were doing gaming, uh, the first uh, sets of games that we released on Facebook that were cloud streamed um, were not, you know, Twitch action shooters or online battle royales, right? They were puzzle games, card games, strategy games, right? Where people were getting what they felt was a responsive experience. Now, you know, if you're in VR, obviously you turn your head, you have to render the right thing to avoid discomfort. Um, but, um, but those are some of the techniques that, that we can use. We can use design, we can use prediction, and then we can kind of invest in our network topologies to be as close as, as possible. Great, yeah, I think that, that's a great answer, uh, Mike. Next question from Ross. Uh, will RTC in the metaverse be more effective and inclusive? Is that being measured? It's a great question. Uh, anyone? I can I can take uh, a bit of that at least. I think on the audio side, we've talked a lot about spatial audio, but you can't just have spatial audio because if someone um, doesn't have hearing in one ear or is deaf, obviously you have to take that into account as well. So when you're creating a spatial scene, you have to have a mode which is mono. And you have to be able to do um, speech to text to be inclusive in, in these environments. And speech to text may not be just for inclusive. You might um, you might be uh, watching it from your phone. You're know, accessing it via a phone from a public space, so you don't want the sound up. So um, I think you have to take this into account as you're building it out. And from our side, if you drop back to a mono mix for the audio, then you actually have to take a lot of the voices out because. If it becomes unintelligible, even in mono, well, it come, it's very unintelligible in mono if you mix a whole lot of voices together. So you definitely have to design this into the communication system. Great, yeah, I think it's still early days, but these are great principles to uh, abide by. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanna add a, a point here. Um, I, I do think there's some good news in terms of inclusivity, which is that many of the, the leading tech companies uh, are thinking about this a lot and, and not just thinking about it, but acting on it, right? So there were new sets of avatars released onto Facebook and Instagram recently. And I'm the member of, of a group of people who create virtual worlds, you know, using Horizon Worlds, right? This is just a public group with people who don't work at our company. And there was this excitement where people were posting uh, images of their new avatars and their hearing aids. They're like, oh, now my mini me can have a hearing aid just like I have in real life, right? And, and then they were talking to each other that somebody had in both years and somebody else had just in one year. And they're like, how do you get it to work where you can put it in both years? And so, you know, part of being embodied in a virtual environment is being really inclusive in the types of embodiment um, that represents everyone in the world, you know, not just uh, one segment of, of the population. Um, so, you know, that's just one example, but I do think this is, you know, squarely in mind and, and we'll see, um, we'll see a lot of tech companies continue to invest in kind of diversity and inclusion. Brilliant. I mean, that's such a powerful example. I mean, um, it's an embodied internet, but you know, as realistic and as inclusive as it is in the real world. It's fantastic. Perhaps a, a last question. Uh, this is from Dave and addressed to you, Colin. Uh, can you talk to, uh, it says our, but I presume it's your recent work as to upgrades along the edge of the internet needed to reducing queuing jitter and latency. There's a reference to uh, um, uh, some of your work. At the yeah, time. so sure. So I, I will, and it, it's it's it, it actually is our I got it is our work. Um, I got the pleasure of working with a, a group of amazingly talented people about latency and real time communications, and they worked on this report that will drop the link in in the room here. This bit tag. Uh, document around latency and around how we need to focus on what changes we need, particularly near the edge of the network, to reduce latency. And it looks at 
gaming, at communications, at AR, VR, at, at a wide range of things. But everybody comes around to the same conclusions of we need to go figure out how we do the queuing differently, how we write different you know, protocols like TCP IP may not be the ideal thing. A lot of this stuff was designed very much to maximize how fast you could transfer a file. And that turned out to not be the right answer for how fast a web page could load. And the quick people have taken a really solid run at fixing that and so, you know, some other parts of that. Uh, but I think that for this new broad communications where we're talking about not one-to-one -one communications, but multi-party communications with super low latency with a whole bunch of different types of medias and forms, we probably also need to relook at this and we need to look at it every stage along the way, uh, both in how we design the applications, but also what the network has underneath us, how the network works. Uh, buffer bloat is the canonical example people bring up of this, but there's there's many, you know, that's part of it, but the more general thing of how we do queuing, how we make all of this work, how our Wi-Fi networks work, there's so much work to be done in those areas to really nail this stuff. I think we could just go on and on, but in the interest of time and in the interest of lunch, I think it's perhaps a time to stop now. So Paul Cullen, Mike, been great chatting with you on this exciting topic. And thanks to the audience as well. Love, great questions, great engagement coming in from the audience. Thank you all. Uh, we'll take a short break for lunch and uh, be back in about 30 minutes.